Hello everyone and welcome to SJ Thunder Warrior. My name is Campbell and today we are going to be talking about making a sandbox for your Mage the Ascension Chronicle. So before we get started, if you could please subscribe, impress upon the Akashic Record, smash the patriarchy and that notification button, join the discussions, comment, name drop us to your friends, and uh, you know, just help spread the love around. I would really, really appreciate it. So one thing that I've noticed when I was like just researching things to do for this channel is that there isn't a lot of like advice for running, for like really planning a mage chronicle. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that Mage is a really nebulous personal game and it doesn't really lend itself well to like adventure modules and other things that a lot of other systems uh, do. So everything is really, um, everything has to be really tailored to the group that you're playing in. And also one thing that I definitely know about Mage is that the players even through no like ill will or anything like that can very easily just wreck a any kind of like intricate plot that you might have through magic or role play or anything like that so having a really like meticulous linear one thing after another plot is kind of difficult uh to really pull off successfully without feeling like railroading or anything like that so Considering that, and also like reflecting on my own experience, I kind of realized that the one way that, not the best, but like the best for me personally way to build out a game is to um, approach it from a sandbox approach. And by that I mean you have, you set up a kind of like a world or like a microcosm of the broader game setting and just have the players exist in that world and try not to force too much uh, plot, but just let them discover things and resolve things. Now, that doesn't mean you just sit back and don't let anything happen and just let them run around and do anything. No, you have to do some planning, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So today I'm going to give you nine steps because, you know, it's mage, so you have to love the number nine. Um, so there are nine steps to making a sandbox for your Mage the Ascension campaign, or Chronicle. These don't have to really follow any set order, but I just have them in the way that tends to work best for me. So step one, make your location and set the tone of your world. Okay, so this is really gonna be the physical frame of your sandbox. It could be a town, it could be a building, it could be a city, it could be an entire state, it could be a whole country, but you need to try and set some kind of like limits just to keep yourself for, as a storyteller from going just crazy trying to figure out everything that's going on in the whole entire world, okay? Um, you want to pick a place that's going to offer some things of interest to your to your players. It could be like a historical connection, it could be architecture, it could be people, it could be culture, Whatever, just something that will draw the characters into, rather draw your players into the scene. And you also want to think about how location will impact the feel of your game altogether, like the overall tone. Um, for example, like a game that's set in the bayou will have a really different feeling than a game that takes place in the crowded streets of Calcutta or in Tokyo, or in an umbral realm, or in, you know, Sheboygan. Try and, try and think of what kind of tone and moods the location that you, you pick is going to evoke in your game. Um, one thing you also want to consider is, like, think about what the spirit reflection of whatever location you're working on is. Um, what kind of umbral spirits are there? Are there even any umbral spirits in there in the first place? Has it been kind of like sanitized or just, uh, is, is it so like sterile that, you know, spirits, except maybe like electricity spirits or something like that, don't operate there? Um, and without all of this, you really want to like engage the senses, you know, think about like the sights, the sounds, the smell. Don't just say like, 
oh, down that street, oh, or oh, that's a tree. You know, really try, try and think of ways to engage the senses of your of, of your players. Just keep a little list of uh, of uh, of descriptors that you can add in, and this is also the part where you want to start doing research, like look at Atlas Obscura, um, weird history websites, all of that stuff. Uh, cause those will help you generate not only, um, cool, like plot threads, but also just a lot of practical knowledge about the surrounding area. And, uh, those things will also help you really kind of like fine tune the mood and tone for your world. The world of darkness is a, is very, very big on, you know, feeling and sense of a place and what kind of emotions, um, a location can like pull up. So you want to try and pick a location and a tone that are kind of like complementary to each other. So step two is power level. So you want to figure out the kind of power level of the game and the kind of it, kind of encounters and stories you're going to be telling. Are you going to be going for really big swashbuckling, uh, umbral spanning adventures? Are you going to be toppling governments, or are you going to be um, looking out for uh, the people on your block? You know, trying to protect them from malicious hauntings or unwanted mystical influences and things like that. Uh, so getting, having like conversations with your players about this is, is really important because that way you get to manage their expectations a bit and also expectations for yourself. Most importantly, you want everybody to be on the same page. And there's a big old motorcycle passing by and that's okay. So number three is making schemes. Now, schemes are basically things that are going on in the world that the players themselves, um, at least at this point when you're first starting the game, the players themselves haven't initiated. Um, one example for, for a scheme in the, from a movie would be um, uh, the Death Star in A New Hope. You know, if Luke Skywalker is your character, he didn't start the Death Star. But that was something that was already going on, already in place, um, until, you know, Leia's spies found out about it, and then, you know, you get the whole New Hope, uh, Hope movie. So you want to try and keep a couple of schemes and plans in mind. You know, ske schemes are, uh, are seed ideas, you know, seed ideas that are out there. Uh, so when you're planning your sandbox, you know, you can keep them simple, just one or two sentences and a description of where they take place and the NPCs that might be involved. Uh, you don't want to overly plan them out until you start, you know, getting some notice and traction from your players. I mean, you can, but if you end up having a lot of schemes around, it can be a lot to do. So you might want to, like, just pick and choose a few, like, prime schemes and then have some other smaller schemes going on at the same time. Um, for example, in the game that I'm running, uh, Three of the schemes that I started off with was um, the revelation and presence of a Helicar cabal that were kidnapping people and draining them of their of their quintessence. That was one scheme. Uh, second scheme was a Botanica being squeezed by hostile um, uh, mystical forces. And a third scheme was uh, the disappearance of an orphan technomancer that made an arch, archway into the spirit world. Like I said, so in short, schemes are things that are going on in, in your sandbox. They are things that the players might or might not uh, be involved in. And three, they're, they're, they're out there. They have their own timeline. They have their own agendas unless the players intervene. And that's when, you know, you get your conflict and your action and things like that. Step four, make some additional NPCs populate your world and tie them into your character's backgrounds. If you have your player's backgrounds already, which is, you know, awesome, pull NPCs from their backstories. Um, if they mention that they have a cousin or a brother 
that they're either close to or strange to, you know, just write out a name and a brief description of that person and then just have that kind of in your pocket. Um, just to be clear, you don't have to fully stat out these NPCs. It's better to have like a name and then just something that they're really good at and something that they're really bad at rather than spending the time um, making like, like rolling up an actual character. If you want to have more stats for your NPCs, take a look at a book like uh, Gods and Monsters or even the, um, I believe there's like an antagonist and extras section in the Mage Core book or really through any of the books that have that have come out over the years and just copy them, change the names, change, change the, the descriptions uh, just so that'll save you some time. Because from a storyteller, you want to, you, you don't want to have a lot of stuff going on in your head. You want to try and keep that as minimal, minimal as possible because your players are going to start pulling stuff out. You don't want to have to be thinking about other things. Okay. Um, also, you want to, th in addition to NPCs, you want to think about different organizations that might be existing in your world, world as well. Um, and these can include anything from like shadowy government organizations to grassroots community workers. You know, so this is where you should definitely, you know, populate that. Step five, house rules and meta plot considerations. The great thing about role playing games is that you can tailor them to fit your play style and the kind of ideas that your group has. You don't have to take everything whole hog. In fact, um, M20 with, with its like future fates and everything leaves a lot of the meta plot up to your own individual construction. Um, but whatever you do decide to do, um, you should let your players know if there are any major areas that you are either de-emphasizing, removing, exaggerating, changing, tweaking, and all that stuff. Also, if you have any, any house rules, this is a good time to write those house rules down uh, just to, so that you're both consistent and clear and that your players have a good idea of, have a, not just a good idea, and that your players have a solid idea of what's going on and what's kind of going to be what to expect rules-wise. You never really want to surprise players with a rule. You only want to surprise them with like the narrative and things like that. Two-thirds of the way there. Step six. Make your, make your player characters together. Um, this can happen concurrently with any of the previous steps. Okay. Um, ideally, you would want to try and have your, your, your player characters uh, backgrounds as early as possible. Um, and because that way, you know, that will be able to help you inform like the kind of world you're in, uh, some of the major players, NPCs, all that good stuff. I know some storytellers are comfortable like just saying like, okay, yeah, make a character, bring it tomorrow and we'll play. Um, I found that that isn't not so much like a recipe for for disaster, but can be make things really kind of kind of disjointed and not have the group like gel together as quickly um, as as one would like. When people are in the same physical or virtual space while they're making their characters, then they can start bouncing ideas off of each other. There's a lot less um, kind of like redundancy. There's more kind of kind of, and I'm not even talking about like skill builds or anything like that. But even just like simple personality things, it, was, it makes it a lot easier for the group to really like gel together. And also players can start having like, like interlocking backstories so, it's, so you won't end up having this like, hey, you meet at a bar kind of situation. I'm sorry. 20 years of meeting at bars. No. No. Also, at this time... Uh, during char character creation, um, you can let players know some hints about the setting so they can so they can plan up, plan accordingly. Um, for example, it would be like I can think of nothing worse than like someone a player making like a really great, interesting Order of Hermes character with like a wonderful background and a lot of motivations, and then find out that you as a storyteller decided to like have the entire order of Hermes diablerized back in like the 18th century or something like that, you know? So in order to keep those kinds of conflicts from happening, uh, making the characters together would be really, really helpful. Um, I also have a suggestion for, for new store, new storytellers. 
there's a lot of stuff going on in Made. There are a lot of factions. There's a lot of like opposing viewpoints and paradigms. Um, so I would suggest for your first for your first couple of stories, you know, just pulling from one faction. Um, don't try and do like a soup of like a tradition mage, a disparate mage, a technocracy agent, and like mix them all up all up all up together uh because a a lot of the people will be really hostile to each other and that'll help and that's like a lot of energy on your side to figure out how to make them work together and b like i said you know you want to try and free up as much of your cognitive load as possible for the things that the players do and also like same with bringing in like uh like vampires or werewolves although you could very easily bring in a vampire or a werewolf pc you would have to also know a totally separate way of doing magic and all this other stuff, and it can be just a, a real, a real headache. So, just put that one on the back burner. And also, if any of your char- if, if if any of your players uh, really really wants to play a Nefandus, I just say, no, nah, just hard pass on that. That's my one, my one recommendation. Hard pass on Nefandi. Okay. Step seven. Plan your first session, and then let go of the wheel. If you want to have a really great first session, I think you should make sure that you are able to plan to have these three things take place. First, make sure your players all are all in the same place. You know, not like scattered about in four different locations throughout the city for the first like three, four sessions. That just slows everything down. Uh, B, you want to have them if on the same side or at least not directly opposing each other in whatever conflicts you generate. And C, you want to link one or more schemes that you have in place to what what's happening. Um, you really want to resist the urge to like hurry players along a specific path, but you know let them explore, kind of like gently guide them through through the world, but don't be like, okay, you have to do X, Y, Z thing. Okay. Um, let them, you know, discover things, let them become invested in the world. And then they'll have a much richer, more, uh, vibrant time, uh, coming across, across the schemes, picking their own plans of action and things like that. Now we are at part eight, maintenance, 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 maintenance. Okay, so you have your sandbox full of schemes. You have your NPCs, you have your um, your organizations, you have your characters that are out and running around, and now your job is done. You're basically here to just abdicate dice rolls at this point, you know, because you just did all this planning. No. No, that's not, what hap- that's not what's happening at all. Um, you need to help keep consistency with the world. You're still guiding and still setting things up. Your scheme, you need to be aware of how your your players' actions are affecting the world around them and how the world around them is affecting your players, okay? Um, a real easy way to do this is to just keep little notes at the end of each session. Um, write down any NPCs they came in contact with or any NPCs, but especially especially make a note of any NPCs that you had to come up with over the course of the of the adventure. Um, that's something that I'm terrible at. Sometimes I might make like three or four NPCs in a single single session and I totally forget what they are by the next day and I'm like, okay, then I have to have the awkward moment of like saying like, hey, so that guy you guys talked to yesterday. Yeah. Spare yourself that. Um And also really pay attention to what your players seem to be interested in. Um, You might end up having to drop some schemes or make some new schemes in order to, like, uh, continue their interest. Um, And always, always check in with your players. The easiest thing to do, and also one of the easiest things to forget to do, is to just say, like, hey, so... How is this going? How are you feeling about the game and how and how and what direction 
it's going in. Um, asking your players that can make a whole world of difference and it can let you know of things that you might be doing that you think is like super interesting and cool, but is just falling completely flat on your group. Okay, and nine. Last point that I want to make. Uh, you want to try and plan an endpoint to an arc. Now, an arc is a collection of stories, a collection of schemes, a collection of adventures that your characters go on that have some kind of progress to it, that shows some kind of growth, some kind of change, either within them or within the world around them. Um, and you want to make sure that when your players accomplish something, that it, it's, it's meaningful in some way. And it's not like just, oh, great, you did this amazing thing, you defeated this complicated foe, um, here's a cookie and that's it. You know, here's some XP, that's it. No, you, you, you want it to, to make sure that there's some kind of um, uh, both rewarding factor and also something that helps push the, the larger story forward. You, you, you want to think about what will happen when your conflicts are resolved. What is it going to look like? Um, how will characters be rewarded, lauded? How will their characters have changed or the world that around them changed? Um, don't just say like, okay, you get like five experience points this session instead of three, you know? Try and make something involving the narrative. And also don't just have the end of it, the, the end of an arch being the end of uh, the action. Um, for example, in a story that I did, um, that I'm running, uh, the mages defeated this group that was stealing quintessence from people, and there was this, we had this big dramatic climactic ending, the bad guys were vanquished, but the players had all this corrupted quintessence, and now they had to figure out how to, how to purify it, and maybe put it to some good use. So that would, and then that jumped us off to a whole nother story arc. So when one scheme ends, Think about how that will impact the rest of the world that, that you've created. Will there be power shifts or power vacuums? Will more attention be drawn to the players? Will the players suddenly have more responsibilities? Um, and these are all ways of making the end of a story really not the end. Because if you think about it in life, just because you finish one thing, you still have maybe a half dozen other things that you need to take care of, right? And it just makes the game more interesting and more... Uh, more rewarding in the long term. Okay, so those are just kind of like my quick, uh, my quick guide to making your own Mage Chronicle. Um, I hope it was helpful just in terms of like organizing. I tried to keep it as general because as possible because there's so many different ways you can cut a Mage game. Um, if you enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, notify, um, give us a shout out on Twitter. Um, I think I'm just going to put the Twitter name right up there. Um, I'm on Twitch also, but I'm not really sure. I'll put my name for Twitch up here. Um, I'm on Twitch also, but I honestly, I have no idea what I'm doing on any of those. Please help me. But other than that, thank you so much for um for listening if you're a new storyteller or an experienced storyteller um drop down in the comments let us know what you thought about this or what kind of tools and techniques that you use to help build your sandbox and with that have a great day and play